So here's one result that comes out of it. I said that just, just now, I said that if uh, you had to, to do this for um, infinite square well, cubic square well, then you could do this, right? That's what I said. And when you do it that way, the way you would do it is by what's called the separable solutions. It turns out this three-dimensional wave function, it can be um, under special circumstances, it can, you can um, find kind of basis or uh, kind of almost like unit vector like a solutions. You can find these forms of solutions. Uh, if you are looking for general three-dimensional solution, if you are dealing with uh, like a Cartesian uh, system, like an infinite square well, sorry, infinite cubic well would be, then you could uh, actually write it, uh, solve it into this form big function x as a function of x. This is not a good name. Uh, I'll go with it. Capital Y in terms of y, capital G in terms of t. This is what's called separable solution. I think you might have heard of this term before. Separable solution, yes? Right? Yeah. And uh, that's the technique that you use. And in fact, once again, if we had an extra day, you could do this with the infinite cubic well. Um, it's actually doable. Uh, what's difficult and what we are not spending a lot of time on is how to do that for the spherical coordinate system for um, this potential. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to cite the result. That um, when you write all this out, there's a form of a differential equation. And for the hydrogen atom, this uh, um, function of radius, azimuthal angle, and whatever the other angle phi is, you can uh, separate this into um, into um, into two solutions. You can separate it into the radial function, which is going to be a function of radius alone. So it function of r alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can separate it into radial function, and you can separate it into angular function. Uh, that's a function of theta and phi. And this actually has a sp special name to it. Um, so uh, let me just give you the name so that you can look it up or whatever. This is called spherical harmonics. And it actually occurs in um, essentially any time you are dealing with um, um, central potential that depends only on r then the, you can separate out your solution and the angular portion becomes a spherical harmonics. So that's the description you will see in your textbook, like going through this, the, et cetera, et cetera. You know, read through this description of the, yeah, it's, uh, this, is our, this is our convention and as long as you're in a physics class, you follow a physics convention. Um, and um, yeah. And so where they are separating this as theta and phi, um, I'm just combining that as a spherical harmonic. But um, so, so what it is, is I wanted to stop here. So you can parameterize. Um, um, there are parameters that characterize each of these uh, solutions. And this is, uh, we call them quantum numbers, and this is what you might have seen in your chemistry class. And that's what I want you to spend a little bit more time on. So when you look at this radial function, there are going to be uh, two parameters that characterize it, n and l. And when you look at the spherical harmonics, uh, it'll be characterized by all three uh, uh, quantum uh, quantum numbers that we are going to introduce, n, l, and m. And I guess um, you've actually seen one of these three quantum numbers before. Do any of them look familiar? A, n. n, yeah. So this n is actually the same n you saw in the Bohr model. So we call n. Uh, Let's see, let's go with the right. You, we call n principal quantum number. And 
in the Bohr model, I guess the key thing that came out of the Bohr model was that your energy was equal to minus E naught or for hydrogen 13.6 EV divided by N squared, right? That's what you had in the Bohr model. And this is the one correct result out of the Bohr model. This is still correct in this uh, quantum mechanical, uh, fully quantum mechanical treatment. So what that tells you is, I guess, um, whatever this is spherical, well, no, I guess let's leave it, wait. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah I, I guess I'll just leave it there. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So this N is the principal quantum number, and I guess the best way to associate some kind of intuitive sense to that is to think of it as it, um, it, it, it think of it as it tells you how far the electron is away from the proton on average. Now, it, you cannot nail down a specific distance. That's where chemists use the visualization of an electron cloud. Um, but in on a, as a general rule, this n tells you how far. Um, in fact, if you want to find uh, some probability of an electron at the same location as the proton, then um, the only value of n that will give you that is n equals 1, the ground state. For, actually, for, yeah, I'm pretty sure for any value of n higher than that, probably the finding the particle at x equals, r equals 0 is like 0, I think. Well, <laughs> let me go over the other two quantum numbers. L might look similar to the um, other quantum number you have seen before. Um, where else have you seen the letter L before? Sorry, it's too much of a kind of far-fetched thing. Do we use it? We use L for angular momentum, except to avoid the confusion, it's usually the capital L that we use for angular momentum. So this is where you would have seen some kind of L. And I will tell you now, this L is related to this L, but not quite. So uh, let me give you a name for it, oh, if I remember it. Uh, angular momentum quantum number, orbital quantum number, it's one of those two. Uh, let me call it angular momentum quantum number. And uh, your textbook actually gives you a proper name. Let's look it up. Uh, what does it call L? Ah, all right, angular momentum quantum number. And uh, M has other names other than this. Uh, but this is correct description as far as it goes. So, um, so this L, so by the way, all these quantum numbers, as you can see here, they are usually integer values. That's why we call them quantum number. These are how we quantize different states, different energy levels, and, but there are physical quantities that's associated with the quantum number. With the N, it's most closely associated with the energy directly. Um, that's where you get this. This is called the angular momentum quantum number because this L is associated with the, the magnitude of angular momentum of the electron. So imagine if you have proton and electron orbiting around like this, then um, you know, it has angular, some value of angular momentum pointing in this direction, right? Now imagine it's spinning like this. So it has different value of angular momentum pointing this way, but both this state and this state could have the same magnitude of angular momentum. So both of this state and this state would have the same L, magnitude of angular momentum. And this is the place where Bohr model starts to go wrong because the magnitude of angular momentum is not, well, for one, it's not N H bar. It's not even L H bar. It is um, some other number, let me write it down. It, the magnitude of angular momentum, capital L, is equal to, well, there's a h bar in there. It, h bar is the unit of angular momentum, it fits in there. But it's h bar times square root of L times L plus 1. So, um, uh, my one looks weird. It's L 
times L plus 1. <laughs> and uh, I am afraid that there's no really intuitive way to explain this other than that's the result you get from the mathematics of it. Good? Questions? Good? Um, so this thing that we are assuming, so, um, so what about what we are assuming in the Bohr model? It turns out you can still salvage this if you, um, um, if you reinterpret this as uh, not meaning the, the magnitude of angular momentum, but instead the projection of angular momentum. So your textbook calls this last quantum number m. It calls it angular momentum projection quantum number. That's fine, that's a correct description. Let me, um, I will give you the name and then double check to be make sure. The more fancy name for this, which I like better, is called magnetic quantum number. Magnetic quantum number. And let me just to make sure that I'm remembering it correctly. I don't know, I haven't double checked before. Uh, magnetic quantum number. Orbitals available in a soft shell. Sorry, that's chemistry. Um, all right. I, I, yeah, is that what M is? Yeah, yeah, value of M. All right, good, good, good. Yeah, so that's magnetic quantum number. And I actually prefer that name uh, mainly because uh, that kind of ties in better with what we do in uh, atomic molecular and optical physics. So this magnetic quantum number actually has a physical meaning. Um, as, the, as your textbook says, it's the angular momentum projection quantum number. So this is actually associated with um, the, so the way we usually arrange the coordinates with the projection along the z-axis. So if you take the angular momentum, take its projection along the z-axis, then that projection takes on the value of m times h bar. So you could say, all right, this uh, n, we actually meant n. We meant a different integer, not n. And we actually meant the projection, not the magnitude. Now let me point out uh, kind of um, um, Something that I'm hoping will have you wondering for a while. Um, let's say, um, let's, you, let's say you have an electron in some state here uh, where it's orbiting the proton this way. And let's say we have the projection of this uh, angular momentum of the electron so that it measures plus h bar. Good. What would you say the magnitude of that angular momentum is? If an you know, electron is spinning this way, so the projection along the z-axis is, or, or you know, it's not actually spinning, all right? So you have a proton and you have some electron in a formation around it. When you measure a projection along the z-axis, you measure h bar uh, plus h bar. Um, what would you say is the magnitude of the angular momentum of the electron in that state? Do you need to know any additional information? Okay, so let me uh, draw it here. So let's say, uh, so you have a proton here, and uh, let me just uh, draw electron in some mysterious cloud, right? So, uh, so I'm, not, um, I'm not assuming some kind of classical picture. So I have say, electrons in some mysterious cloud that represents the state of the electron, and you measure the uh, G component of angular momentum. There are different ways of doing it. Let's say you just did it. And when you measure g component of angular momentum, you measure that to be plus h bar. All right, good. Um, suppose someone asks you, what is the magnitude of angular momentum of this electron? If it moves in your plane. Yeah, so that's why I didn't want to say, uh, because moving in a plane implies a classical picture. Right? So I didn't want to give you the classical misunderstanding. It, what, are there any additional information that you need to know? Like, uh, so you, you said you wanted to know if it was moving in a plane. How uh, else would you express that idea in terms of physically measurable quantities? 
that uh, if I, you know, whatever quantities you want me to measure, I will tell you what your measurement will be. Well, velocity is another classical quantity. Uh, linear momentum is, uh, well, it's quantum mechanical, but because it's you know, um, around this thing, it, mom linear momentum will be constantly changing. That's why we are describing in terms of angular momentum. Let me give you a little bit of help. I think what you're trying to express is the x and y component of angular momentum, right? Because if something is moving only in one plane, then its angular momentum is in one direction, and you won't have any angular momentum in the x or y direction. So I can tell you this, whatever state this is prepared in, Lx, when you measure it, is going to be 0. And when you measure the y component of angular momentum, it's also 0. So it, I'm asking you for a state that's uh, somehow met, you know, found that way. What do you think is the, um, the magnitude of angular momentum for such a state? Yeah. So this is where your classical intuition will disagree with rigorously derived quantum mechanical result. Because for a state that's characterized this way, your magnitude of angular momentum will be h bar times square root of 1 times 1 plus 1, or this. Or I guess h bar times square root of 2. <laughs> There's no real intuitive way to get at that. Um, what I can tell you is this. Um, so you have, uh, I guess, you know, your intuition has to start from somewhere. Um, so these different values they can take is probably a good starting place. So you will see how starting with the n principal quantum number, n limits the values that n l can be and L limits the values that M can be. Okay? So what that means is for N, so if your um, electron is very close to the proton, then it limits how much angular momentum it can have. In fact, for the ground state N equals 1, what is the largest value L can be? Yeah, zero. So this is actually another thing that Bohr model has wrong. Bohr model doesn't allow for zero angular momentum state. Turns out n equals 1 corresponds to angular momentum 0. This is the spherically symmetric state, or in your chemistry class, you would have seen like electron cloud that's just kind of fuzzy ball. It doesn't have any other feature other than that. That's your n equals 1 state with the zero angular momentum. Um, all right. <laughs> so, um, so, and with the higher values of n, you can have more angular momentum. Uh, that's uh, uh, expressed by additional values and L can take. And so L is the angular, the magnitude of angular momentum. So in some intuitive sense, the most that the projection can be is plus or minus the magnitude. That's what this limit represents. Now, what I want you to be careful with is for the actual values you would measure is this is the actual projection you might measure, and this is the actual magnitude you would measure from some other set of measurements. And um, other than to puzzle you, I think I'm just going to leave you there. I'm not going to really explain how that comes from. Um, your textbook does try to explain it with some figures. I think, is it in this section? Yeah, so it's a, it like tries to give this figure, and you can kind of imagine the quantum mechanical angular momentum as this arrow that's spinning around the z-axis. So when you measure the average value of this or this projection, you get 0. But it comes down to there's a fundamental uncertainty relationship between measurement of these three. So it was actually wrong of me to give you an impression that I can prepare a state in such a way that you can have a determined value of LG and have a determined value of these two. You can't. I can only talk about the expectation values of this, which are zero. <laughs> um, and you know, so your textbook does try to describe the angular momentum. I have some lab activity in mind. Um, but uh, let me try to work that out for Thursday, and um, 
will have all of the lab period to start developing some idea of quantum mechanical angular momentum for you. Because um, I feel angular momentum is one of the truly quantum mechanical concepts. It's uh, one of those things where the first time you see it, you think it corresponds to something you learned in classical mechanics. And the more you learn, the more you realize uh, it's not actually very classical. So um, I'll try to come up with some exercise for the lab, um, taking advantage of the three hours of time you have for the lab. Um, but for today, I just want to leave it there. Uh, three quantum numbers. <laughs> These relate to the angular momentum, magnitude, and projection. And in some intuitive sense, you can kind of relate them that way. You know, magnitude, it can only be zero and positive. And projection, it can only be plus or minus the magnitude. But when you go into deeper detail, there are some discrepancies. So that's something for you to be uh, beware of as you get into that. 